Pastor's Heart and Dominic Steele and today a Pastor's Heart for our kids with James Galea. But before we come to our topic today, can I ask you to become a regular financial partner of the Pastor's Heart? There have been a group of people who've been supporting us and we're super grateful, but we need to grow that base. It's been a while since we talked about needing assistance, but our costs are up and so we're asking for your help. We'd love it if you could go to patreon.com slash the Pastor's Heart and become a regular partner with us. It is hard for those of us who are pastors and yet didn't grow up as pastor's kids to really understand the life of the child of a pastor. And even for those who grew up as children of pastors, there's every chance they're forgotten. Kath and I, we have three kids, now young adults, but neither of us grew up as pastor's kids. But James Galeer is with us, senior pastor himself at Freshwater Anglican Church on Sydney's northern beaches and grew up as a pastor's kid in Western Sydney. James, um, instead of us starting with the pastor's heart, mm. maybe we could start with the heart of the pastor's kid. And uh, what was going on in your heart as a pastor's kid growing up? Yes, it's an unusual experience, uh, which you don't think is unusual until you look back on it, because you just grow up in being a pastor's kid. And so having the experience of ra raising pastor's kids now is all like, to call them children, uh, and also being a pastor's kid, it's a unique experience. Um, I think the closest probably it is, analogy-wise, is probably being a politician's kid. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I can't imagine what it's like to be the son of a PK. Or, Anthony or, Albanese, yeah, where you're, 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 you're under scrutiny for having a chairman's lounge pass. The <laughs> nation is looking on you, thoughts about what your dad should do, shouldn't do, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And so it's probably a bit like that, but at a much smaller level. Mm -hmm. And so you are in this sort of fishbowl uh, kind of experience and is it's unique. Uh, but And there's, it comes with that joys. There's a lot of amazing experiences. I mean, I was part of a church growing up, which was started as a Bible study, and it grew to a large, healthy evangelical church in Western Sydney, and the joys of seeing many people become Christians, but also there's a lot of challenges and things you're exposed to which other Christians growing up in the church aren't experiencing. Mm. Barnabas Piper in his book says, pastor's kids are so often messed up. Right. Has that been well, your ob observation? Yeah. Or? Messed up. Oh, I... Th I wouldn't say messed up um, as, me as much as uh, other people have messed up. I mean, we're all messed up in mm -hmm. many ways. I think you're just privy to more of the church life than others. And so you see the messiness of that as well. And so that can affect you in different ways. Because you overhear the kitchen conversations or... Kitchen conversations, uh, you... Yeah, and, and I think just also too, it's being aware that um, I've had a very positive experience of being mm -hmm. a pastor's kid. Uh, and that's largely because church was healthy. Dad was a good dad. Uh, I'm more extroverted. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got a sister who's introverted. Uh, you know, having people in the home was more a drain on her than for me. Mm -hmm. And so everyone has a different experience in this. And mm -hmm. so it's a range of different things. And then the result of that can be different as well. Mm. As you've talked to, I know you've talked to some other people who were pastor's kids in mm. preparation for today. Um, what are some of the challenges that people have had? Uh, I think, I remember a moment, it was about 15 or so years ago, being on a, a youth camp, uh, which was had a lot of Christians from different um, parts of Sydney, and there was a lot of pastors, kids, and missionary kids. Uh, and at this camp, there was a seminar for them, and I was part of it, and we uh, were in this circle, about 30 of them, and I just said a statement like, some of you may feel like your dad's ministry is more important than you, and about half of them just sort of nodded. And that was, it was a haunting nod, really, just mm. seeing them that their experience is sort of church ministry is here in their dad's values and priorities, and then they're somewhere down here. And that was, that, that sort of scared me, and the sort of just seeing them nod, because the reality is in their world, um, bec I, I, I think there's a hard balance between, a fine line between servant-hearted sacrificial ministry and workaholism. Uh, that most members of church don't know the difference, but in a family you can tell the difference. Um, you can tell if your why is your dad doing these things, um, uh, and just I, th I think just like the antidote for greed, generosity, I think the antidote for workaholism is time. And so if there's time spent away from ministry on you as a family, then you can see your dad's priorities coming out, and you know Jesus is everything, but 
church is not, um, and those kind of things. So, yeah, I, th- I think at the end of the day, uh, I experienced a positive experience because uh, I remember a moment where uh, Dad would have time together with us probably once a week or so, each of us, and whereas time where he would spend with just us. And there was a moment, it was a knock at the door, and we were about to go have time together, and Dad said, and the person at the door said, oh, I need to meet with you, Ray, I need to meet with you. And in their mind, it was an emergency. It was an emergency. But Dad said, oh, I'm having time together with my son, and we can meet later. And that was a profound moment for me, because I realized uh, the priorities of Dad um, where I sat, um, that he worked hard, uh, but I was a priority in his life and he promised his time and we went off and spent time together. So the, the time element is an important thing. That's why a lot of pastor's kids' holidays are very special because dad or mum is away from the church with families present, um, active, and that's why holidays for a lot of pastor's kids are very special times because dad is with them. Um, so it's just not limiting time with kids to holidays, but time in the week to week as well. Mm. Now you told that little illustration of ministry was more important than me. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I felt a mm. knife in the heart yeah. at that yeah. point. And you described kind of a knife in the heart mm. at that point. Um, as you've, I'm, I'm sure that moment has mm. impacted your own parenting. Mm. Mm. Do you want to just? Yeah. So for me wanting to, uh, spend time with my kids. It's the balance of wanting them to grow in their faith and see uh, that life's not all about them, but uh, also to valuing them. And so that I think it's a hard balance, but I've tried to you know, do time together with each of my kids and listen to them, get to know them. Um, I think the knocks at the door uh, when you live in a rectory uh, don't happen as much as they used to. But what does happen is the phone is more present now. And so uh, I've, I've had the battle of putting phone away, taking that time together, being at the dinner table, present phone away. And that's my battle in terms of being present. I may be physically present, but am I emotionally present with them uh, is, is my struggle. And so mm. fighting for that because, uh, I, yeah, I may be physically present with them, you know, the dinner table, that kind of thing, but I just know I'm, uh, I may be aloof. And sometimes they can see it. They'd be like, Dad, Dad. You know, they'll, mm-hmm. they'll, they can see I'm thinking about the budget's not in a good place or that well, I'm, partial was, breakdown was, and that kind of thing. It was Saturday for me, last Saturday. Mm. And um, uh, Kath and I were doing something. And then suddenly I thought of a better opening line for the sermon for, mm. for Sunday. Yeah, and, yeah. And I thought, I've got to go and write this down before I forget. Yes, but yeah, yeah. I must have been distracted in my interaction with her yeah, beforehand. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so just that, the, the suck of ministry, it, I think for some pastor's kids, they become bitter towards it because it sucked the life out of dad. It sucked mm. the life out of mum, and, and they bore the brunt of that mm. because they didn't have the dad around the way that they should have. Mm. Yeah. Um, awareness other people knowing things about mm. your, your life. Yes. Um, uh, how did you go with that? And what's, what's advice for church members who know things about, I don't know, you playing soccer or whatever, or your yeah, soccer yeah. win or your... Yeah, yeah. Well, um, we had the uh, philosophy growing up where uh, we could... Dad would use us in so many illustrations if asked for permission. Uh, but if he didn't, we'd get five bucks. So when you're a kid, five bucks for your dignity wasn't too bad. And so we had that sort of deal. But uh, you do mainly through uh, sermons, people know things about you and they think they know you as well. Um, And so I think uh, there's a goodness to that, you know, because, you know, the qualifications of an elder is is a bit of a what's life like at home? You know, Mm. is the pastor the same at home as they are on a Sunday? And so character and the way you lead and love your family is important. So there's a goodness to that. But then I think unintentionally the either amount of sermon illustrations or the appropriateness of them, um, uh, I've sort of realized like I will ask my kids, can I tell this story in a sermon? So I ask them for their permission. But sometimes they'll say yes. And I'm thinking, I actually got to think, is 
in 10 years time, will they still want this story mm. being out there? Because as a 10 year old, they're like, oh yeah, this is great. You know, I'm, I'm mm. for this. But as a 17 year old, would they still want it? So there's a bit of wisdom that you need to have as the adult of, as a goodness in sharing, asking for permission uh, to share it, but also to thinking future then, would they still want this story? Is it appropriate to be told in the future? If that makes sense. Mm. So I, I think I think it's the sermon that it's the the big part where people know things about you and um, and that kind of thing because there's an openness and a goodness to it, but there's a line. Mm. Yeah. What about people making assumptions about you? Yeah, I think that's a hard one because people just assume, oh, you're a pastor's kid, your faith's going great, you're rejoicing the Lord, uh, and you don't have doubts. Uh, and so I think doubts is a big one. It, uh, is there, am I allowed to have doubts and ask questions um, and not feel like I have to have all the answers? Um, because you do grow up in church and you know you, you are aware of the Bible, you know the Bible verses, you know the Colin Buchanan songs, that kind of thing. So there's a familiarity and you know what the answer is of Jesus, the Bible, that, and you can uh, spit them out, but then there's a healthiness in Am I allowed to actually have a doubt? So I went through a big season of doubt of, is Jesus God? For about a year, year and a half. And uh, How old were you then? Oh, I was about 18. Uh, and so, uh, but, and I was also a youth leader at the time. And so I was trying to rest like, is Jesus God? And, and a whole factors brought about this, these doubts, but it was that journey. But what was helpful was I was allowed to go on that journey and, I just saw in other people at church, they went on journeys of doubt and came out the other side and, and grew stronger. So they get me hope, but a culture where I was able to share and wrestle with and ask questions was profoundly helpful. I wasn't shamed into thinking, oh, you're a pastor's kid. You can't mm. have any doubts. You should be fine. Um, because often when people have doubts, it's more reflection on them because they're thinking, well, if you're doubting and you don't have any confidence, what about me? And the, it they get worried and so they think, oh, no, you shouldn't doubt, just, just believe, just believe. Mm -hmm. um, but, and that was very helpful. By the end of that year and a half, I came out with the conviction, no, Jesus is God, but I had to go on that journey. Um, so being allowed to do that, not assuming that theology, their life is all neatly packaged Did up. Did you feel like you were treated differently by the youth leaders because you were the son of the senior leader? Uh, I, I think sometimes you can get uh, fast-tracked into mm -hmm. leadership roles because of either pastor's kid and not go through the normal reference checks mm -hmm. that others would. So sometimes you get fired, and that's not healthy for anyone. I can think you need to go through the pro proper process of mm. character reference, commitment to church like everyone else. Um, sometimes you get treated differently. Uh, I remember, this is different to the youth leading experience, but uh, I think it was seven, eight, going to the morning tea table, taking way too much food than I should. Uh, and then someone said, oh, you shouldn't do that. You're a pastor's kid. And for me, I was like, oh, like, uh, I still remember that moment, obviously. And I think the problem with it was not that they were calling me out, but they should have said, oh, you know, we don't do that. We want to be generous um, because we're Christians, not because we're mm. pastor's kids. And so I think there's a healthiness in being part of church community where I'm being discipled, not just by my parents, but by others, like my family. But coming back to, and this is what I say to a church, treat pastor's kids as Christians, not as pastor's kids. Mm. And because we do need each other grow in sanctification, it's a communal thing, um, but focus on their faith uh, and treat them as you would others um, who are growing in their knowledge and love of the Lord Jesus, who are living in grace. Yeah. Mm. Um, you know, as you were just saying that, I was thinking uh, my wife is really clear on We've got to focus on dishonesty, disrespect and disobedience with our kids mm -hmm. and not sweat the small stuff like what kind of clothes they wear and yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah, things yeah. like that. Yeah. And yet I'm pretty sure some people kind of raised eyebrows yes. about yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. different clothes. It's picking your battles. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, people did expect you to be the perfect angel, though. Yeah. I, I, the church I grew up in, was there wasn't a... A Rev and Lovejoy Simpsons kind of pressure. Yeah. Uh, it, it, I would say it was a healthy mix. There was examples that I shared before where it was not great, but um, generally speaking, it was it was good. And I think 
having leaders like a youth leader who discipled me, a guy called Kev was profoundly influential in that and he treated me just like one of the teenage boys. Mm. Um, and so that was really helpful um, in that, yeah. What did your parents particularly do well as you think back? Uh, I think they, uh, I think a couple of things. One is yeah, the time together element was looking back, that was the men a lot. So that, and my love language is quality time. So maybe, but I think my sisters would share the same. So that time each week of, okay, I know dad's busy. He's got a lot to do, you know, leading a church plant and, and all that. But there was a time when I knew he would spend with me. Um, I think also to uh, one of the big things, to be honest, was uh, them saying sorry. So uh, years as teenagers, young adults, there were certain things that they did, which either through us sharing or them realizing that they weren't great in certain areas in parenting. And rather than hiding behind that, well, no parents perfect, you know, we're all just making up. Rather than hiding behind that excuse, they owned it and said sorry. And I can still remember those moments of them saying sorry for the things that they didn't do as well as parenting. And that, that just meant the world. Mm. Um, and I think uh, that that's one of the things that I want to do in my parenting. I, there's mistakes that I'm going to make. I'm not going to do a perfect job at this. And But if I live in grace, if my sin has been forgiven, then I can own it and listen and the things that I failed in, in, in apologize to them. Um, that in, even though they're good parents, that for me made them great parents because they own their sin, confess it and ask for forgiveness in the ways in which um, yeah, they, they weren't as good in parenting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That was healing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, you grow up, I mean, your dad, not as prominent as somebody like, um, I don't know, Brian Houston or Mark Driscoll or John Piper or something, but in our circles in Sydney, yeah. pretty prominent and on major convention platforms in Australia and that kind of thing. Yeah. How did that make it more complex for you? I think uh, it wasn't. It didn't. It wasn't a negative thing. I do think if you're the son of a pastor who has been publicly um, asked to stand down for various reasons, inappropriate behaviour. Um, then that brings a shame and sticks to you. Uh, I, I don't know what that's like. Can't imagine what that's like. Um, if your dad's more a controversial figure or, um, for various reasons, um, then I think that would be harder. Dad's not that. He's yeah, yeah. Uh, so if, in my mind, it was a, is a positive thing. But I do think also to the uh, you some pastors' kids, and I do can err into this there is a pride um, or entitlement that can come about as well. So sometimes there's the bitterness extreme, but there's also there's a pride entitlement where you can find your identity in being a pastor's kid um, and the connections and, and it can start small of just like you get the leftover um, you know, food from a meeting or that kind of thing. Mm. Oh, you get these sort of special things. You can start there. You're, you're first at the church to check out what's in the church fridge. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you kind of get those kind of export benefits all, all the way to like being known. And if it's a positive thing, uh, that can get to your head and, and create an unhealthy pride as well. So there's that extreme as well. So just knowing your own heart um, uh is, is an important thing because, yeah, so I think, I think it, it depends on what perception the pastor has community-wise can affect you, and then that can either lead in different directions. Bitterness, pride. Um, for me, it was more the battle with pride. Mm. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Keep going? Oh, I, th- I just think uh, you... Like my default is all like when I became a Christian, it was letting go of the good things I'd done, and realizing they absolute didn't matter in terms of my salvation. So I've always battled with that in that space, and so in terms of pride of um, either what I've done, who I know, my achievements, um, and growing up uh, that uh, as a pastor, that was always my wrestling was what I've done. All the good things I've done uh, didn't mean anything in terms of my salvation. Mm. And so that, that has been and always been my battle. Mm. Barnabas Piper says, few people can do hypocrisy more smoothly than a pastor's kid. Mm. 
expand comment. Yeah. yeah, I think you yeah because you can you can easily live one way on a Sunday and a different way either at home uh, or at school uh, and because you can particularly the hypocrisy can be you can act a different character on a Sunday as act a different person on a Monday in, in the more extreme ends yeah mm -hmm. yeah so everyone battles with hypocrisy at one level but I think there's just an extremity to it in being a pastor's kid because of that communal nature the spotlights on you that kind of thing mm -hmm. yeah um, identity issues and sorting out your own identity mm. as a person yourself mm. I imagine it's a, I mean it's something that everyone has to go through mm. but what are the complexities in sorting out your own identity distinct from a high profile dad yeah I think it was funny one thing that was helpful in me growing up in my faith was actually moving I think I might have been year maybe 13 14 15 something like that moving from the morning service and going to the evening service and that was that step was actually me saying I'm going to go to church on my own Dad was still the pastor of the evening church, <laughs> but it was separated from my family. So I was owning my faith and choosing to go. Um, those kind of moments, school camps, um, where, oh, sorry, oh, sorry, Christian camps uh, were really helpful because I'm, I was away from the local church community with meeting with other Christians, growing my own faith, allowed me to um, be a Christian and not be seen as a pastor's kid. Those, so things that were separate from that moving out of the home, actually, when... Uh, I realized, oh, people don't just turn up to your house. You have to invite them in, like, because I was just used to people always being there in the house. And so those kind of steps of independence were healthy and helpful because it was, is this faith just one I've inherited um, or is it my own and my identity in that? Um, so th those, those steps of independence and parents allowing me to do that mm. um, was helpful. Mm. Yeah. Um, what about um, uh, teaching something different to what Dad might have taught, like forming your own theological yeah, yeah. thoughts yes. and, yeah, yeah. and ending up disagreeing with him on a point? Yeah, or, yeah. yeah. Well, even uh, me at a simple thing of not being in Western Sydney, uh, ministering there, is uh, it's not a theological thing, but me ministering in Northern Beach, a different part of Sydney. Uh, when he's given his life to Western Sydney. Yeah, I loved yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that, that it, it's a, it may sound very mild, but that was a, a sacrifice in some ways. Or that was a, a, not a sacrifice, but more like a, that was a tug at the heart because it was, it was different to what Dad was doing, but that's actually been healthy for me in ministering in a different part of Sydney um, in my own um, pastoring journey. Yeah. So where I am and not where I thought I'd be growing up, but it's actually been healthy for me in that separation um, and a, a different, uh, avoiding comparison in mm. some ways, yeah. Because now, I wanted to compare myself with that in terms of character and with those kind of things and be like him in godliness, but I don't have to be like him in everything. Mm. That makes sense, yeah. Now, lots of our regular Pastor's Heart audience are people in pastoral ministry, mm. but I'm assuming that for this episode we have some kids of pastors mm. watching, listening, engaging with us, and probably some adult kids of pastors, mm. some of whom it's going well with Jesus mm. and some of whom they've walked away from Jesus. Mm. What do you want to say to those different groups of people? Because uh, you obviously talk to people in that situation. Yeah, yeah in both. I think... Uh, if I think if you're walking well with the Lord, I think God has placed, it's not an accident that he's placed you in the family that he's placed you in. He's, he's as a pastor's kid, he's, it, uh, you have a unique experience and he's using that for your own discipleship growth. And so with the challenges uh, or the joys of that, it is, it is, he's discipling you. And so see it, um, in that through that lens in terms of where the trials come the temptations come um, you, you use it in terms of your growth and love of Jesus I think if you've walked away from the Lord or if it's been a very negative experience and burnt out or whatever it might be um, I and you've particularly had a negative experience of your dad because he might have you know 
um, or for whatever reason, um, I think go to your, don't uh, compare your dad, uh, sorry, do compare your dad to your Heavenly Father, um, not your Heavenly Father to your dad, because Heavenly Father is, is that prodigal, I always think of the prodigal son, he's the father on that doorstep, that um, waiting for us to come. Um, he's not, you know, disappointed we didn't um, achieve certain things, be certain things, let us down. He's, he's, our Heavenly Father is that one at, at the porch waiting for us, no matter what we've done, no matter what we've come, to come home. And so um, that would be my advice, is, is um, just know that God's love is constant and is there every day. And whatever that moment that you may realize like, oh, I may have had a bad experience of church or being a pastor's kid, but yet God loves me. His son died for me and he wants me to come home. Just always remember that because um, that truth is liberating. And yeah. Mm. Now, as you, as you spoke just then, I was thinking, I think James is speaking to the person who, well, it wasn't great mm. being the pastor's kid, mm. um, but but it wasn't that actually Dad was profoundly wicked. Do you yes, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and yet there are some pastors mm. who have spectacularly done the wrong thing, mm. and uh, and we have watched um, uh, great falls from grace. Do you mm. know, a pastor being arrested or something mm. like that um, for for a for something that was seriously wrong um, in the eyes of the world and in the eyes of mm. the church. Um, what's your word to that child? Uh, I think I cannot imagine what that would be like. I think that is just the, the horror, the shame, the embarrassment is prof- like it would be profound. Um, I think my word to them would just be, uh, God is different um, to what you've experienced. Like God's, you, if you've experienced that, that is not what God intended um, for pe- shepherds over His flock, and acknowledging that uh, it is that, like in terms of the the failure uh, and. And then, but also to going to the fact that wherever he has failed, Jesus has not. And um, just going back to who Jesus is, his gentleness, his kindness, his perfection, um, his consistency, and who he is, the character of Christ, um, and not going to him um, and encountering him would be yeah my encouragement. But I think a lot of people, it's just... They don't, they haven't had this experience. There are some, um, but I think most people, it's, it's just normal day to day interactions, and they've uh, decided they've had the same experience as another one who's still a Christian, but they've decided, no, I don't want to follow Jesus anymore. And um, there could be a whole range of reasons um, for that. They might blame being a pastor's kid, but sometimes it's just the love of this world, there's materialism, and so they've they've gone in that direction and that I haven't experienced that but that I made it as a profound grief as a parent um, so my words to pastors who are experiencing that just be responsible for what you're responsible for as in none of us are responsible for making our children Christians that's God's job he's the one who turns the light on so to speak um, but we are responsible for the way we've behaved and and um, presented that Jesus in different ways and so I think as pastors uh, going back to what I said to my parents in terms of what they were responsible for for their actions and apologising for that, living in grace, because I do think a genuine sorry is the beginning of healing um, for a lot of the relationships, yeah. Mm-hmm. Thanks so much for coming in. Pleasure. For sharing. James Galea, our guest on The Pastor's Heart. James is the Senior Minister of Freshwater Anglican Church on the Northern Beaches. You've been with us on The Pastor's Heart. My name's Dominic Steele. We'll look forward to your company next Tuesday afternoon. 